Welcome to episode 345 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing writer-director Kyle Couch. He wrote and directed a film called The Tent, which is a post-apocalyptic thriller. He's done a lot of shorts to get to this point where he's now directing his first feature film. We talk a bit about the shorts and then we dig into The Tent and how he brought that picture to life. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast sh- podcasts at sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episode number 344. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and career letter, and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So a quick few words about what I'm working on. Still plugging away on my mystery thriller feature film, The Rideshare Killer. I just got another cut of the film back from the editor. We're getting very, very close to locked picture. You know, maybe one or two sort of very small passes we should get to locked picture. It's coming together nicely. I've been interviewing colorists and sound folks, trying to find the right people. Um, Really, it comes down to a lot. It was scheduling. um, You know, a lot of the people, I, I probably put the ad a little too early out and started getting um, resumes a little too early because some of the people I've contacted, they already have other projects. So this is always sort of the difficulty with low budget projects is you don't really get precedent because you're, 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 um, or preferential treatment because you're, you're typically paying less than what a lot of these guys make on other projects. So, um, so anyways, just going through, I'm getting resumes and just going through, and I basically need to bring that all together. Tony, my producing partner on this film has been working on the contracts and also he's been working with the composer to get her hired. I think we're very close on that, but hopefully here in the next couple weeks or next month or so, we'll get to lock picture. And by that time, we'll have all these other positions filled I'm going through this cut now, trying to decide if it's worth doing reshoots or not. There's definitely some shots I'd like to get, but with COVID and everything, I just have to weigh the cost and the benefits of this. We did budget a little bit of money to do like a day of reshoots. Um, So there's definitely some things I want to do, but I've just got to sort of think about the logistics and and if it's really going to be worth the effort. I'm starting to think about festivals. Um, That was something I just was mulling over, and I'm not really sure if we're going to submit this to any festivals. Um, in the current state with COVID. I mean, all you're really going to get out of the festivals um, with COVID is some digital laurels. You know, you get accepted, maybe you'll win some awards. Um, And I guess that's nice, but a big part of the festivals, um, certainly living here in LA, the LA festivals, you know, that I would submit to would be nice to actually go. The cast and crew could come out, see the film. Um, Obviously with COVID, none of that's happening. So I'm going to probably punt on that and kind of wait and see. Probably won't. We're hoping to get the film done by the end of the year. Um, And maybe I'll have a little more beat on where I think COVID is heading. Um, Certainly if we get to the point where we have a real viable vaccine, let's say by March, um, then I think um, that then the festivals will be back up and running. And I think I'll probably go and submit to some, but if it gets too much later, I'll probably just go straight to the distributors. I mean, if COVID continues to persist, I'll probably just go straight to the distributors and, um, and not even do the festivals, but um, we got to figure that out. Anyway, mainly I'm just going through this latest cut and making notes on the final little things that need to be tweaked. Again, at this point, we're dealing with kind of minor things and and um, just cleaning up some of the some of the problem areas. A lot of the action scenes, some of the action stuff, just needs a little bit of tweak to just make it seem a little more realistic. But um, we're in pretty good shape. Anyways, that's the main thing I've been working on over the last few weeks. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing writer director Kyle Couch. Here is the interview. Welcome, Kyle, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. It's it's my pleasure. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? So I got started uh, probably, I would say, in my early 20s. 
um, making short films and <clears throat> just kind of progressing from making short films into 50 minute films. And then, um, once I did that, uh, you know, I, I, I felt ready to do, you know, feature films. And mm -hmm. so, um, so really that's, I just started meeting people and, and, you know, I, I met people who had similar interests as far as just progressing their career further. And, um, and really it's, it's, it really took off for me when I met, uh, uh, Tim Kaiser, who actually plays David in the film. Um, so he, he is a man that wears many hats and, uh, between him and Nancy Lynette Parker, um, our executive producer, those two I've been working with probably since 2015 and, uh, and they really helped kind of cultivate that, you know. So perfect. And we'll, we're going to jump back into that. Um, and I would like to hear sort of your story on how you met them. But first, let's talk about some of the shorts you've done. I'm curious, um, how did you get these shorts made? Did you just self-fund them? Did you have some sort of technical background in running a camera, editing? Um, just how did you have sort of the wherewithal to start doing shorts? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that came from just self-learning. I did go to college very briefly. Um, I ended up getting an associate's degree in cinematic arts. And that's where I learned a lot about kind of struck story structure and script writing and, and what have you. And so um, really, once I, I, I got out of there, um, I realized I didn't really have any too much onset training. And uh, so I just kind of started making stuff and making mistakes and and having to kind of go back and, and redo things. And um, so with the short films, it was self-funded most of the time. Um, up until probably, I would say, uh, roughly five years ago, um, they, they were all self-funded. And uh, I think the most I had spent up to that point on a short film was probably about 500 bucks. Um, and most of that goes towards food. So and, and then the technical aspect, I just, yeah, again, a lot of that was teaching myself. And, you know, occasionally having a mentor come alongside of me and, and teach me kind of the do's and don'ts. But a lot of it was very much self-taught. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that I definitely get a lot from screenwriters is just how do you have the confidence? I mean, why why were you able to just go out and start making shorts? Was there some like didn't you have these feelings like, well, how am I going to figure out how to run a camera? How am I going to figure out how to edit? Um, and I feel like a lot of people just get bogged down in sort of those fears. How did you overcome that? And how did you just get out there and do that for a short with really no no money and no experience? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really great question. Looking back in retrospect, um, for me, a lot of it was just I've always wanted to to be a filmmaker. So I knew I would have to figure it out and you have to start somewhere. You know, it, it, I didn't know what I was doing when I first started, you know, and I'm still learning, still learning now. You know, I, I certainly I'm not like saying back then I didn't know what I was doing and now I'm a master or anything. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm still yeah. very much learning and I, I will till the day I die. But you know, I think I think a lot of it was just starting somewhere, you know, writing 10 pages of a script, um, not a very good one. And and then just going out and shooting it, and, and, you know, finding a camera or, or saying, hey, you know, could, do you have a camera? Could I borrow a camera? I mean, now it's a little easier because everybody's got a camera on their phone. But back then it wasn't quite as widespread. So, um, yeah, for me, it was it, it was definitely uh just starting somewhere and grabbing a camera, going out, getting a few friends who, you know, were willing to act and then um, then using like Windows Movie Maker or something like that to edit the footage. And that's really editing the footage is when I realized what goes into making a film. And so that it was just kind of grabbing the bull by the horns in, in, the, in a way and, and just going out and starting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So let's dig into your latest film, The Tent. Maybe to start out, you can give us a quick log line or pitch. What is this film all about? Yeah, so The Tent is really about two people who come together at the end of the world. You know, they they are surviving the night and they, they come together at the end of the world and they, they have to survive the night together. And um, they've chosen the destination of surviving in a tent. And so uh, through that process, they learn that each other uh, have different ways to survive. And so they really have to figure that out and figure out how to make it work between the two of them so that way they can survive the night. Gotcha. Where did this idea come from? What was the genesis for this story? 
You know, Genesis really kind of came from, you know, I, I had a dream. I had a, actually a very vivid nightmare. And uh, that kind of inspired the initial injury to do something that was a little bit more, I guess, I wouldn't even categorize it as a horror type uh, genre. I would categorize it more of a kind of a drama, hard hitting drama with, you know, some thriller elements to it. And so for me, you know, I had never tried my hand at that. And so that's kind of where it began with, you know, having this very vivid nightmare and then um, it just kind of progressed into like, okay, if you're going to take this idea or this dream and make it into a, a film, what is the the heart of it going to be? Then honestly, I just dug in my past and some of the things that I've never really seen. Uh, I, I've seen represented, but I haven't seen represented in the way that I wanted to see it and, and kind of plug that into this kind of uh, housing, if you will, of this nightmare that I had. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so let's talk about your writing process. So you had this dream, you started to think about it. Then what are those steps to actually taking, um, making it into a screenplay? Are you someone who does index cards? Do you spend a lot of time outlining? Um, and then how much time do you spend outlining? And then how much time do you spend actually in final draft cranking out script pages? Yeah, so um, I actually use Celtics. I don't use final draft, um, but I definitely, I love final draft. I think it's great. I just I don't know. It's it's kind of one of those things where I'm like that. I've always used Celtics, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I've heard good things, yeah, about Celtics. Yeah, I really I, I enjoy it a lot. But you know, I think for me, it's it's coming up with an outline first. I, you know, it's I've tried it the other way where I don't have an outline and uh, not with the tent. Um, by then, I was I was mainly doing outlines. But um, you know, for, for before that, I, I just didn't do outlines. I would just write it. And, um, you know, for a short film, maybe that works because it's it's so short. But with mm -hmm. something that's long and, and you're going in a bunch of different directions, it's, I couldn't have done it without an outline. So, uh, you know, I looked up a bunch of different ways. And first I tried doing kind of eight plot points, uh, you know, kind of studying Sid Field and all those different ways of telling a story that are tried and true. And, um, and then for me, I just found this kind of – uh, 40 point uh, thing where you can, you put your 40 plot points down and it was intense, but it really kind of helped me to see, you know, what, where the movie was going and when it was in that direction. And so, um, so I really just kind of wrote down pretty much everything that I knew about it. And then uh, I, I drew up a few timelines for things that didn't even end up making it in the movie. Um, just where were the characters before, and where did they end up afterward and you know what were some of their backstories and those are super helpful for directing the actors kind of telling them where they came from and their motivations and then um i sat down and i wrote the script and i wrote it and i wrote it and i wrote it and i wrote it and i must have written it probably about 10 times um now that's not 10 complete rewrites for me that was you know writing the first draft and then you know, going into that first draft and kind of editing it and then going into it and re-editing it about 10 times um, and, and really kind of smoothing out the edges. And, you know, it, it's definitely we shot the movie back in 17. So like even now I look back and I'm like, oh, man, I could have I, I wish I would have wrote a rewrote it a, a few more times. It's just I think that's that's how obsessive you can get with just rewriting and recrafting it. So for me, mm -hmm. it was. I think I, I ended up giving the actors draft 10 and I was like, all right, here it is. And they're like, okay, mm -hmm. cool. Gotcha. Are you one of the people that has um, works in their home, home office? Do you go to Starbucks? Do you need that background noise? What does your sort of writing routine well, look like? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I couldn't do star. I couldn't do a public place. Um, for me, um, usually I turn on some instrumental music and uh, depending on the vibe of the scene, and or I just make a playlist that I know the direction that is going to go in. And then I just sit in a room by myself, home office and just write and write, write, write. What do you I hear about these playlists that people make? What do you use to make a playlist? Oh, I use Spotify. Yeah, yeah, it's really helpful. 
Let's talk about your development process a little bit. Um, so you crank out this first draft. Um, what did it look like in terms of getting notes? Do you have a, a bunch of trusted actor, writer, director friends that you send it to? Um, how does that process look like? And how do you interpret people's notes that, that come back to you? You know, uh, yeah, I, so I do have uh, very trusted. I, you know, the thing is, is that I'll have somebody who's a writer take a look at it, who also writes screenplays. That's kind of my go-to. Is, is for someone like that to take a look at it and kind of read through it and then tell me like the issues that they had with it. Um, and we kind of sit down maybe and talk for a couple hours about those issues. Then I go back and I rewrite it and then I give it to them again. And, and we kind of go through that process over and over until it's like either, you know, we don't agree on something and I feel very strongly about it or, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like I can't can't get past this hump and I have to go back and rewrite the whole thing. So, you know, um, I also have just regular people who enjoy reading. Um, I think that to me is the most important because that is, you know, when you take somebody who has no experience with a screenplay per se, or they're just an audience, you know, they're just somebody who watches movies, who reads books and they go, that was entertaining or, you know, kind of, lost my interest. Um, so I, I have a few people, quite a, quite a few people actually that I, I let check out. That's kind of an, from an audience standpoint. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, usually the last people to get it are the actors. And, you know, for me, I'm not, you know, I'm not at a point where everything that I write has to be is sacred. Right. So even on set, I'm not married a hundred percent to dialogue. If, if people, as long as we go in the right direction, um, I don't mind if if they, you know, are feeling something different and they want to change up how the language sounds or uh, which often happens. So, yeah, it, it's definitely for me, it's it's more important once we get to that point on set that the actors can identify with the characters um, instead of me making sure that the dialogue comes out and it's, you know, 100 uh, percent on book. Yeah, gotcha. So you mentioned just a second ago that you had this 40 um, beat outline. Is that from Blake Snyder? And I'm curious what I'm sort of getting at is what is your approach to screenplay structure? You also mentioned Sid Field, who's obviously real big on the three act structure. Um, what is your approach to screenplay structure? And then specifically with a sort of post apocalyptic horror thriller like this, was there some sort of genre requirements or other films that you looked at? How do you, you know, use those tropes from other films and maybe subvert those tropes a little bit? Yeah, so um, that's a big question. Uh, gotcha, yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, I, I think uh, I'll try to sum it up. You, you remind me if, if, I, if I miss uh, something. But uh, so I think uh, the first question you had asked is, is that 40-point 40, 40 you know, plot point. Um, I'm not sure who wrote it. I had found it, and I just kind of bookmarked it. Uh, I found numerous things, you know, uh, from 40 points down to like just three, you mm -hmm. know, and um, or usually five, you know, and uh, and then Sid Field was probably the first author that I read an entire book of his on, on screenplay writing. And so, um, yeah, he's super huge on the three act structure. Um, and and I think there's some validity to that. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I do think that um the whole idea and, and my kind of approach to it um and again i'm still learning uh mm -hmm. but my approach to it so far has really been just finding those moments to kind of slow it down and allow exposition to come through in subtle ways um and of course you know as cliche as it sounds you know what the characters aren't saying is just as important what they are saying so you know, really, um, you know, I think dialogue, I'm still really like trying to fine tune that for myself. Um, but I usually know ahead of time uh, kind of what the ending's going to be. And and I do think that that's really important. You, you need to know where is this all going? What is the ultimate, you know, say message at the end or what is the thing you want to leave the audience with? Um, and then, you know, I think the end just as important because again you know that's you're going to lose your audience if you don't have a powerful intro or something that intrigues somebody to keep watching and so you know really like what's between the intro and and the the end you know or that third act is 
you know, this really big piece of exposition and kind of getting there and twists and turns and, and finding ways to challenge the characters in a way that maybe they never have before. So um, that to me is the biggest challenge. And so that is where a lot of my time is spent um, in trying to figure out. And that's where that 40 plot point kind of came in handy because it's, I know my beginning and I know my ending, but it's how do I get there? You know, how do I get to that third act that I daydream about all day? Um, so I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it did. I think it did. Um, so let's talk about, so now you have a script, you've rewritten it 10 times, you're starting to move it. When did you bring Tim into this process? It sounds like you've known him since before this project was written. Um, were you keeping him, were you pitching it to him before? Was he involved with the development? Maybe talk about that a little bit. Um, Tim was involved from the from the get-go. So he knew I was about to start writing it with him in mind as the lead. Um, so I, I knew I wanted him to push him in a direction that I had never seen him act before. Um, and I knew that this was the story to do that. Um, I knew I wanted to make this movie and I knew I wanted on a different level to push Tim as an actor to, to go even further uh, than I had seen him go. And this just felt like a perfect marriage of the two. So he really knew about it. Like he got to, Tim was a different story than most actors. He got to read almost every iteration. Once we got to that final draft or the second to final draft and Tim says, uh, I'm sorry, it was like the probably the third draft in and Tim is reading it and he goes, you know, and I'm again, I don't want to give anything away. But, you know, he's like, I really think that this would be interesting if we if, at, if towards the third act, we went in this kind of different direction. And, and we were always going in that direction. But um, he was like, let's hit it hard. Like, let's not just kind of touch on it. Let's hit it hard. And uh, I was like, absolutely not. You know, I, thanks for the advice. Thanks for the, the critique, but I'm going to move on. And he was like, all right, that's fine. You know, like, uh, we, we have a good relationship like that. Yeah. Um, and then that night I sat down and I was like, I wonder what that's like. I'm just going to write it. I'm just going to, you know, dip my, my hand in the cookie jar and see what, see what it feels like. And I couldn't stop writing for probably about an hour and a half. And uh, I wrote probably the last 30 pages of the script within an hour and a half, just, mm. it just was flowing out of me. And I was like, Oh my gosh, is this, is this something different? And uh, is this, you know, the direction we're going to go in? And then I sent that initial draft to Tim and he was like, dude, I'm, I'm bawling my eyes out in this hotel room. Oh. Like, this is fantastic. Oh. And so then, of course, once we decided to go in that direction, I kind of backtracked and started making changes throughout to kind of have breadcrumbs that led in that direction. Uh, it's kind of hard to talk about because. Yeah, no, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. So let's back up a little bit. How did you meet? Um, and it sounds like Nancy, um, your executive producer, how did you meet Tim and Nancy? Um, maybe talk about that introduction, because I know that's going to be a question. Well, how can you meet guys like this, talented people that, you know, want to come along and partner with you? You know, you know, it's funny that it's happenstance, you know, I mean, I met uh, I was already kind of producing videos and, and what have you. And then uh, Tim, he was actually uh, doing like a summer Bible camp for his church and they were volunteering at our ch my church and um a, f a mutual friend of ours said hey i know this guy and he's acted in movies before i don't know if you'd be interested and i said yeah absolutely so i meet this guy and i'm like okay this guy's a really nice guy like uh cool and the, and, and he says to me uh, uh we, we kind of started conversating what project have you worked on oh i've worked on this and i've you know well i've mainly done independent short films for myself and he goes well, check out this trailer of mine. And he showed it to me. And in and, and the in the movie that he showed me, he played a bad guy and kind of this slimy, greasy. And I'm like staring at him and I'm staring at staring at this trailer. And I'm like, this you are not the same person. And he didn't have a beard. Like he looked exactly the same, but his whole and I'm like, wow, like uh, I'm very impressed. And um, and then one thing led to, you know, nothing ever happened. And, and I gave him a call and I said, hey, I have this perfect role for you. It's an older guy. Um, you know, would you would you be interested? And he said, absolutely. And uh, and that's that's really it. Um, ever since then, we've been working together. And, and Nancy, Nancy's a little bit different story. She came on when I shot uh, a, a 50 minute short film um, for a nonprofit. And basically it was kind of a fundraiser 
type scenario. So we, we made this short film and we hired a whole crew and I directed it. And, uh, and it, the whole idea was to premiere this in a movie theater to raise money for that nonprofit. And it was about, you know, addiction and recovery and, and stuff like that. So, um, so we needed somebody that could get us actors and just, it, again, it was just somebody knowing somebody, you know, I think we just started putting things out on Craigslist, like actors needed for a movie, you know, low pay or something, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And, um, and then somebody connected us with Nancy and she was like, Hey, I, I, I'm an actress, but I also produce. And she ended up executive producing that short film. And, and again, just like with Tim, the rest was history. So uh, it was just kind of, there was no special recipe. We just kind of put ourselves out there and, and said, Hey, listen, you know, like we're just trying to figure this thing out. We don't really know what we're doing, but we're, we're trying to figure it out. And, and then these people were like, great, we'll, we'll come and help you out. And, um, they saw that we had some significant financial backing with some of our projects and they saw that we, you know, were serious about it. Maybe we weren't as skilled as some of the people they had worked with, but they could sense that we had heart, you know, we were serious. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and really those two people, Tim and Nancy, um, I equate a lot of my success in continuing to make films with because they have always believed in me. Um, and, and that I think more important than finding somebody who is connected in the business is finding somebody who believes in you because yeah. there will be times when you do not believe in yourself. And there were many moments like that in my path where I'm like, ah, oh, this isn't going to work or whatever. And they're like, yeah, so what, even if it doesn't work, keep going, keep pushing, you're going to get better. And I have, I've significantly seen that. So, so yeah, I, I would say bigger than connections is finding people that will walk alongside of you and, and, and continue to be cheerleaders for you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Great advice. Where, where are you located and where did you shoot um, the tent? Uh, I'm located uh, probably about 30 minutes outside of Detroit. Um, I'm actually located in Pontiac, uh, Michigan. Um, and we shot most of the tent uh, in and around Michigan. Uh, the, the actual kind of out in the woods shoot was in Ray Township. And then actually inside the tent was all on a stage. So we, our amazing cinematographer, Robert Skates, uh, lit it in such a way that transition was flawless. I Watching the film, I remember being, that was one of my worry points was, oh man, people are going to be able to tell, tell this is on a stage and this is outside. And for me, I don't know, maybe other people can tell, but for me, I was like, wow, that's flawless. Like between him and David Peterson, who was the editor, I thought like they, they sold the idea that this was all in the same spot. Great. One of the questions that I get very often from screenwriters is, you know, do I need to move to L.A.? What is your take as someone who's not in Hollywood, not in sort of the L.A. scene, um, making films outside of L.A.? Why haven't you moved to L.A.? And what's sort of just your thinking in general on this topic? You know, I think when I was younger, moving out to L.A. was like sounded like a great idea um, because that is where, you know, the business is. That's where, you know, it's it's kind of like. For me in Michigan and, and Detroit primarily, um, the the big business, you know, is cars and and you know, uh, kind of and uh, but it is in in a way and it's Detroit is known for its Motor City, L.A. When I've gone out to L.A., it's like they are a movie making machine factories everywhere, um, and so there's posters everywhere and just movies, 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 TV shows, media, everything. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I feel like if you, if you want to, you know, back in the eighties, if you wanted to get in the auto industry, um, you would come to Detroit, right? Why not? But, you know, I think if you want to make movies and stuff, it does make sense to a degree to move out to LA. I think the challenge is, and, and, you know, as, as you, as people will come to find out, it's, it, it wouldn't have probably continued if it wasn't for them because I had that moral support. I had that, that emotional support um, and not just their expertise and their craft. Cause trust me, that's there for sure with both of them, but it was just the emotional support that they offered and, you know, skipping town um, or leaving town, you know, and going out to LA and kind of maybe being alone for a little while, you know, it, it is challenging and it's, it's tough. You're going to hear things. You know, if you're if you want to be an actor and you're auditioning, 
you know, you're going to hear things that you don't like to hear. If you, if you're writing scripts and, and doing all that stuff out there, you're going to hear things that you don't like to hear. And as long as you have a strong support network, I think, I think it's okay. Um, you know, but that I think is for me, the biggest challenge. I don't have as strong a support network out in LA as I do here in Michigan. Um, and now after starting a family and, and all that stuff, I, I don't want to, I have no interest in, and, in, you know, I love visiting LA. I think it's great. Um, but moving out there, you know, unless a big job happened out there, I, I honestly, I would be perfectly content with making movies in Michigan. Gotcha. So um, you have your script, you have your team. What was um, your strategy for raising money for this project? You know, the biggest strategy was, you know, this was my my feature film debut. And so, you know, kind of, uh, you know, it was less about, hey, invest in this thing and we're going to get all your money back and, and all that stuff. I mean, that certainly plays a part, I think, with any business. But it was more about kind of, uh, you know, helping to support that next step that I was taking as a filmmaker. And so, you know, in the beginning, when you've never made a feature film before, uh, it is it is pretty challenging to say, well, hey, look at this example. You know, there's no example to show. There's just short films and, and what have you. But, you know, it's a different ballgame with features. And so um, so really it was friends and family that I was coming around and, and saying, hey, you know, and it was funny because, you know, uh, unfortunately, they most friends and family didn't have enough money to, you know, even give away at the time. And so, you know, it, it was it was sitting down. I had a friend of mine, a mentor who uh, was just very good with business, owns a few businesses himself. And basically, he helped me to write a business plan. You know, what is this going to look like? How long are you going to shoot for if? If you can't necessarily promise everybody their money back, what can you promise them? What can you give them? And and just sitting down and really figuring that out. And and then just, you know, it was it was almost as, you know, not nearly as long, but almost as challenging as writing the script itself was sitting down and figuring out, okay, if I raise this amount of money, I can shoot for this many days. If I raise this amount of money, I can shoot for this many more days. And I can bring on this many more crew members. And, you know, what we ended up was, uh, you know, uh, a very solid amount. And then, you know, again, investing your own, you know, money. Uh, you know, if, if you're not going to invest anything in it, then why would somebody else, you know? So it's it's just a, a, a constant process of coming up with a business model, coming up with an idea to to bring people in on a feature debut. And and really, you know, talking to them and and discussing what this is going to look like moving forward, um, you know, not necessarily with the film, but in in a career point. Um, and and you know, it's crazy. People get really really excited to invest in a career in chasing after something that is almost as unattainable as as making films. Um, you know, I know personally when. I've actually recently had somebody come up to me and say, you know, I, I can't get funding for anything. And I said, listen, you put in the work and you show me a solid plan. And I see through that, that viewing of that solid plan that there's heart there and there's a determination easily. I would come up off a thousand bucks, 2000 bucks to give you towards that goal. Um, easily, you know, it's, it's really about seeing the work and the dedication that somebody is putting into it. And that's what, you know, my friend had taught me when, when I was creating this business model. So you can sense confidence, you, you, you know, and you can also sense not so much confidence. And, uh, you know, sometimes you got to fake till you make it, even if you don't know, you know, you're like, uh, you know, we'll see how this turns out. You know, you certainly don't want to do that in front of somebody. Yeah. You were talking with the guy doing your business plan. You mentioned that one of your angles is simply having people invest in you so that your career can go forward. And that certainly works with friends and family. But were there some other things that you came up with that you could offer to these investors um, that would be potentially enticing for them to invest in, not just ROI and not just investing in your career? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing is just saying, hey, listen, um, you know, I have a lot of confidence in this script and I have a lot of confidence in this film and my ability to hire people that will also help back me up and make a good film. And so, you know, you just it's really about offering percentages. You know, if you have basically I had nothing to offer right off the gate except for my own money into the film itself. 
And so, you know, it's a lot of like being honest and, and saying like, Hey, listen, um, it's a gamble. You know, I think that honesty really goes a long way. You know, you don't want to sit there and be like, Oh man, I'm going to get you back, you know, $10,000 that you're investing or $20,000 that you're investing. Uh, and I'll get it back to you in six months. Well, you can't promise that you mm-hmm. really can't. And so I think it's very important to be honest and upfront and say, Hey, listen, you may or may not get the, I, I, and that's kind of what I was providing, you know, was just, Hey, an honesty and if after I'm honest with you, you don't want to come on, that's OK. But, you know, really, it was, it, you know, I wish I could tell you uh, that there were other things that I was offering. But, mm-hmm. you know, I really do feel like a lot of it was, you know, the heart. And, and it was, uh, you know, n- not thanks to me. It was thanks to the person who taught me the business, uh, business planning, but offering that heart to people and them yeah. feeling it and, uh yeah, that that was that was really my my one and only, you know, or it was just going to be a lot longer road to get there. Yeah, yeah. Passion can be contagious. Um, what what is next for you? What what are you working on now? Uh, right now, I'm uh, writing another script. So I actually just started physically writing it. Uh, I'm kind of at a point where when I get ideas, I just write them all down and I put them into the uh, a Google document and that way I can open it up anywhere and add to it anytime I want from my phone or from my desk at work and um, and then just uh, constructing so this time it was like 10 outlines hmm. as opposed to 10 different versions of the script so it's just continuing to learn to like kind of start that process um, mm-hmm. back a little further and uh, so now I'm finally at the point where I'm writing the script. And uh, uh, it's very exciting. And it's kind of a psychological type movie, but it's a lot more grounded than tennis. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, what have you, I'd just like to close the interview by asking just, you know, what have you seen recently that you thought was really great? Is there anything on Netflix, Hulu, anything out there that um, maybe would be good for screenwriters to check out? Ooh, um, you know, I'd have to reference, there's two things that I watched. Uh, probably the two best TV shows possibly i've ever seen in my life Hmm. um the first one was uh mr robot um i kind of got late on that train of watching mr robot and uh that last season i think it's four seasons um every single episode is almost feels like a different genre of a movie and i just felt like there's literally an episode where it's there's no talking i think there's like one word said at the end um and the rest of it is just action and you know, movement and camera angles. And, and it was just so like, I'm like, what does that script look like? You know, is that just, there's no, there's literally no dialogue, but, uh, and then there's it's, it's same season. There's an episode that is almost all dialogue, two people sitting on a couch and there's revelations made and, and everything. And I just thought that show was uh, spectacular. I would say probably my favorite uh, piece of entertainment or media that I consumed uh, in 2019, um, was the Watchmen series from Damon, uh, Lindelof. Uh, that to me was easily the best 10 episodes, or I think it was 10 episodes that of TV that I've possibly ever seen. Hmm. It's just the, the writing was so crisp and so real and, and yet it's the Watchmen. So it's like, like superheroes and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, oh my gosh, that was phenomenal. That, huh. that was the type of show that gets me excited about working in this medium mm-hmm. uh, and I cannot recommend it more. It's so yeah, good. Yeah, I'll have to check that one out. How can people see the tent? What is the release schedule going to be like on that? So the tent's actually out now. Um, it's available on Amazon. Uh, it's available on, tar- uh, pre-order at Target, uh, on physical DVD or Blu-ray. Um, it's available on iTunes and, Google Play and uh, Vimeo. Uh, uh, I think it's Vimeo on demand and then uh, YouTube as well. So you can get it. I mean, almost, I think anywhere. Um, and then, you know, we have our social media page, uh, the tent movie, uh, both on Facebook and Instagram. And, uh, and then our website's got a lot of cool little Easter eggs, uh, survive the tent.com. Okay. Nice, nice, perfect. Um, what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I'll round up for the show notes. 
Yeah, um, you know, I don't have Facebook or Instagram at the moment. Uh, I kind of I had one and then I kind of backed out of it. Um, but uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. And I okay. love just hooking up with people and making connections and, you know, looking for opportunities to work with people. I think it's great. I, I love networking. It's, it's the best thing you can do. Perfect, perfect. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films as well. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's definitely, I appreciate talking about this movie. It means a lot to me. Yeah, no problem at all. Good luck with it. Bye. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis. So it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer-director Christian Sesma, who was on the podcast a couple of years ago in episode number 134. So check out that episode if you have the time and want to hear a bit about his background. Um, he's done a number of films. I had him on, as I said, a couple of years ago, and now he is back um, with another film. Next week, we'll be talking about this new film. It's called Pay Dirt, starring Val Kilmore and Luke Goss. We talk about the writing, the writing of this film, casting it, and how it all came together for Christian. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's our show. Thank you for listening.